Deadliest Chemical Weapons. Humans have been wiping each other from existence since the beginning of time. Whether it's a simple squabble or an alls-out, balls-out war, nothing is ever really resolved until at least one side lies in ruin. Spartans? Destroyed. The Romans? Vandalized. The Korean War? Forget about it. While a classic sword to the chest or a freedom seat to the old gray matter is perfectly capable of getting your point across, sometimes nations invest in more creative solutions. And that's where full-on chemical warfare comes in. You see, a quick and easy demise is a courtesy. It's the slow and agonizing expirations that really send a message. So let's see just how far humanity is strayed from the light, shall we? As a warning, you'll be seeing some gruesome images of the effects of these very real and very deadly chemicals. So if you're one to be watching these videos with a big old plate of food, you're in for a bad time. Anyway, first up is mustard gas. A bit more tangy than your average condiment, mustard gas was a game changer in World War I, which was already a game changer itself in the world of warfare. First used by the Germans during the Third Battle of Ypres in Belgium in the summer of 1917, mustard gas is one of the most well-known chemical weapons used during the Great War. But here's a fact for you, mustard gas, isn't a gas. It's not even a mustard. It's actually a liquid at room temperature, which actually made it more effective in warfare. The thick and oily liquid would stick to most surfaces for days on end. And to take advantage of this, mustard gas was packed into artillery shells, which yeah. bombarded the battlefield. The artillery explosions would turn the liquid into a fine mist, spraying all over the place. What's worse is that the lethal liquid would slowly vaporize in warmer temperatures, creating creeping death clouds, which would engulf soldiers. This vicious vapor had a strong garlic or mustardy odor, which is how the chemical got its namesake. But no matter if it's a gas or a liquid, the horrible effects still remain the same. And I hope you're ready for some brief chemistry lessons here, because I'm going to be giving you a rundown of how these chemicals affect the human body. And since I'm a chemical engineer during my day job, you can, you know, Trust me, bro. All right, so mustard gas is what's called a blistering agent. This means that its main form of attack is damaging human tissue. And this is done through the chemical's ability to really fudge up the DNA and proteins in the nuclei of your cells, particularly in the moister areas of your body, like your eyes, your skin, and your respiratory tract. So rest easy knowing that nowhere's really safe, especially if you sweat a lot, like say a soldier in the heat of battle carrying a crap ton of equipment. Any skin exposed to mustard gas will develop severe chemical burns and, thanks to all that DNA and protein destruction, will form very juicy but agonizingly painful yellow blisters, or as I like to call them, the Forbidden Capri Suns. Now with how bad this stuff is on your skin, it's even worse when it gets in your slippery wet eyeballs. If mustard gas gets in your eyes, you're going to be hit with severe and immediate irritation, burning, and in some cases, partial or complete blindness. But that's just the effects on the outside of the body. Breathing the stuff in results in immediate burning and pain in your throat and nasal passages. Why is it spicy? Over the course of a few days, this will evolve into inflammation of said airways, causing restricted breathing, congestion, and likely complete respiratory failure. Those who did survive mustard gas exposure often suffered long-term respiratory complications for years after the war. Despite causing these horrific side effects and being the most commonly used chemical in the old WW1, the mortality rate of mustard gas is pretty low, only making up about 2-3% of all chemical warfare deaths during the Great War. There was a chemical that was much more deadly than mustard gas, and that chemical is... Way back in 1812, Cornish chemist and long neck haver John Davy decided to try to make some new chemical compounds, as chemists tend to do. Today's attempt was exposing a mixture of carbon monoxide and chlorine gas to sunlight. UV radiation from the sunlight actually kicked off a reaction, forming a new gaseous compound. Davy named this creation phosgene, which, when roughly translated from Greek, means born from light. This compound was pretty easy to produce and was deemed valuable in various chemical synthesis reactions. It's even still used today as an intermediate chemical by industries for making stuff like plastics, insulation, and even pharmaceuticals. The problem, though, is that it's extremely deadly if misused. Hmm, easy to make and deadly when misused. Sounds like the perfect candidate for a chemical weapon, said the Germans in a silly and aggressive accent. And that's just what they did. In December of 1915, during the First Battle of Ypres, 
Poor Belgium really can't catch a break. Germans set up about 3,000 cylinders of compressed phosgene gas on the front line. It was then released in a light breeze, causing a deadly white cloud which devoured the opposing forces. Now, phosgene is classified as a choking agent, which, although very kinky, is lethal. When exposed to phosgene gas, you immediately experience violent coughing, difficulty breathing, because, yeah, you know, a choking agent, and nausea and vomiting. Not only will your skin develop painful chemical burns, but your respiratory tract as well. Just like with chlorine gas that I mentioned in a previous video, phosgene has a similar mechanism of action. It reacts with residual moisture inside and outside of your body through a process called hydrolysis, which forms hydrochloric acid and carbon dioxide. The newly formed acid eats away at any tissue it comes in contact with, which hurts, like a lot. The gas also directly damages your body's cells, causing your blood vessels to start leaking out fluids to neighboring organs, particularly your lungs, which is as the French say, no bueno. The excess fluid in your lungs only makes your breathing worse and worse until eventually you're physically unable to breathe and you suffocate. Now you might be familiar with the fact that a key tactic of World War I was trench warfare. Both sides of the war dug miles and miles of trenches as a way to protect themselves from machine gun fire. It's really hard to shoot at guys when they're in a little hidey hole. Well, this is where chemical weapons really shined. You see, chemicals like mustard gas and phosgene are much heavier than air, which means that the gases would creep over the land and pour into the trenches, flushing out any soldiers who happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Warfare involving chemical weapons was horrifying. British officer Martin Greener recounted witnessing a cloud of poison gas approaching his position. Just at dawn, uh, they opened a very heavy fire, especially machine gun fire. And that's the idea, was that apparently to keep, make you get down. And then the next thing we heard, we heard this sizzling, you know. I mean, you could hear this damn stuff coming out. And then saw this awful cloud coming over. Great yellow, uh, greenish yellow cloud. It wasn't very high, about, uh, I would say, it wasn't more than 20 feet up. Nobody knew what to think, but immediately it got there, we knew what to think, I mean, you knew what, uh, what it was. Well, then, of course, you immediately began to choke. Then the, the, the word came, whatever you do, don't go down. You see, if you got to the bottom of the trench, you got the full blast of it, because it was heavy stuff, it went down. Now, you have to remember that phosgene was first used in 1915. The first effective gas masks weren't developed or distributed for a few months, meaning that these first witnesses had little to no protection against this stuff. In the end, phosgene is estimated to be the cause of over 90,000, or about 85% of all known chemical weapon deaths during World War I. Although history likes to highlight the German Empire for their aggressive use of chemical weapons during the Great War, and rightfully so, it was actually France who first used tear gas in 1914. But compared to chemicals like phosgene, it's like hucking a paper ball at a cannon. Just prior to World War I's big spankin' sequel, Germany was experiencing a bit of a problem outside of planning world domination. Bugs. A bunch of weird little weevils were doing irreparable damage to German orchards, which were a key food source. You see, you have to be a little self-sustaining when you inevitably piss off the rest of the world. In response, German scientists were tasked with developing an effective insecticide to wither the weevils. In 1938, one Gerhard Schrader mixed phosphorus with cyanide, developing a toxic compound that was too deadly for agricultural use. If you can't kill bugs with it, eh, maybe you can kill enemy troops with it. This compound was dubbed taboon, from the German word for taboo, because the compound was deemed too deadly for use. But that didn't dissuade Schrader, who rushed back to the lab to perform more experiments. And in doing so, he quickly developed a much more potent version of the already lethal compound. And this new poison was called sarin, a very volatile, odorless, colorless liquid. Why is it so deadly? Well, sarin is classified as a nerve agent arguably the deadliest and most horrifying classification of any chemical weapon. And it works like this. Now really turn your brains on for this explanation. 
In your body is your nervous system. This is basically the entire body's communication network, controlling your movements, your thoughts, your emotions, your memory, muscle function, and passive functions like your heartbeat and your breathing. Well, Saren comes in and fucks all that up by messing with these guys. These are neurotransmitters, chemical compounds that are passed between neurons in your nervous system. Some neurotransmitters you may be familiar with are adrenaline, which gives you that fight or flight feeling, serotonin, the happiness molecule, and dopamine, which hits really hard when you're up about 450% on your spy calls, but you're too stupid to sell them even though they expire in two hours. Well, I would like you to meet acetylcholine. This neurotransmitter is what controls your muscle movement, your thought process, and your learning ability. When passed from your nervous system to your muscles, your muscles are stimulated and move the way your brain tells them to. After your muscles are done doing what they're doing, the acetylcholine is then broken down by acetylcholinesterase, allowing the muscles to relax. So Saren over here comes in and breaks that communication line. Your muscles are bombarded with signals to move, but no signals to stop. As a result, victims who are exposed to sarin gas are no longer in control of their own bodies. They can't think, they can't breathe. The body continues to seize and painfully convulse. This complete loss of bodily function means death is quick, in as little as a single minute with direct inhalation. Compared to phosgene, sarin is calculated to be about 43 times more lethal when comparing lethal dosages. The sheer potential destruction of the chemical was enough to prevent Germany from ever using the gas during World War II. Some sources claim that the main mustache in charge was too scared to unleash it after his own personal experiences with mustard gas in World War I. But the guy authorized using gas chambers on innocent civilians, so... I'm calling bullshit on that one. Regardless of the reason, Saren was never authorized for use in World War II. However, Saren, along with a beefed up version called Cyclosarin, are known to have been used by Iraq in 1983 during the Iran-Iraq War, resulting in tens of thousands of deaths. An even deadlier version of the nerve agent called Soman was also synthesized, but luckily, it's never been used. Together, Taboon, Saren, Soman, and Cyclosarin make up the G series of nerve agents. And you can pause here to read up on them. All right, we need a mental health break here. So let's get some of that serotonin rebalanced. Oh, look at this little guy. He's living it up, he's doing his thing. He's got a piece of fluff, he's probably gonna be, nope, nope, he ate it. All right, ugh. Now look at this handsome little man. I think I know what he wants you to do. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Don't disappoint him. All right, back to the devastation and despair. Venomous Agent X, or VX for short, is a chemical compound discovered by the British in the 1950s. Well, go figure, researching potential pesticides. Oh, how the turntables. Britain pulled the whole copy my homework but in your own words move by building off of the aforementioned Gerard Schrader's work. Once fully developed and refined, the compound was then produced for the sake of chemical warfare, should the world wars decide to become a trilogy. In its pure form, VX is a thick, oily, amber-colored liquid that is relatively non-volatile meaning that it doesn't vaporize easily on its own at room temperature. These physical properties prevent the oil-like chemical from dissipating wherever it's released. It can remain on the ground and plants for days on end, creating poison pools across the landscape. The odorless and tasteless liquid is lethal in very small doses. Just a few milligrams on your skin will be enough to send you vertically packing. The mechanism of action is identical to sarin, causing a complete loss of bodily function and death by asphyxiation. <laughs> However, VX is considered to be much more potent. In 1993, the United Nations banned, along with several other chemical weapons, the production and stockpiling of VX in any amount that exceeds 100 grams, or about a quarter pound, minus the cheese. VX had also been used alongside sarin during the Iran-Iraq War in 1983 as well as a few assassinations, the most high profile of which being the brother of North Korea leader guy Kim Jong-un in 2017, where two women rubbed a cloth soaked with the nerve agent in the poor guy's face at an airport. He received his one-way boarding pass to the northeast Korea in the sky in just 15 minutes. But that's not the end of nerve agents just yet. No, now it's the Soviet Union's turn to dabble in chemical weapons in the 1970s. Many sneaky Soviet scientists were tasked with developing new nerve agents to bypass the UN's banned chemical weapons list. After over two decades of research, the Novichok series of nerve agents were developed. These eight compounds are believed to be the most toxic things ever developed by mankind. 
besides political subreddits. Now, the Novichok agents are functionally equivalent to other nerve agents, but again, are much more potent than the last. Although weapons were created to release these agents, they were never deployed on the battlefield. Instead, these compounds are mainly used in silencing enemies of the state, with one of the most recent cases being in 2018. If you've actually paid attention in any of your world history classes, then you know what this stuff is. Zyklon B. Derived from the German word for cyclone, this pesticide turned humanicide was developed by, you guessed it, those gosh dang Germans back in the 1920s. Originally, for much more innocent uses like getting rid of lice on clothes, to fumigating warehouses, ships, and even trains used to transport cattle. Just cattle. Zyklon B's main ingredient is hydrogen cyanide, a toxic systemic poison. The compound takes the form of small pellets, which, when exposed to air, evaporate into a gas. Now before some nerds out there correct me, the phase change from a solid directly to a vapor is actually called sublimation. This is me saying, I know. What matters is the impact of the gas once inhaled. The biology of it all is very complex, but basically when a victim inhales hydrogen cyanide, it's absorbed into the blood through the lungs, where it breaks down into regular cyanide. This then poisons the body's cells, particularly the mitochondria. You know, the powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> Aren't you glad you learned that one? Well, inside the mitochondria, cyanide stops the cellular respiration process. This means that your body can no longer produce the energy required for your cells to do their jobs. And just like in this American economy, without jobs, cells die very quickly. As a result, the entire body shuts down with death occurring within minutes of exposure. Of course, you may know that Zyklon B was Adolf Hitler's poison of choice to systematically eliminate millions in a bout of weaponized ostracism. You know, during that big historical event in World War II that YouTube doesn't like people talking about. Isn't it great living in a time where we have to censor ourselves when discussing horrific historical events? Anyway, next chapter. During the Vietnam War from the mid-50s to the mid-70s, the US was kind of getting their asses handed to them. Fuck! One of the main problems for US troops was North Vietnam's territorial advantage. Thick foliage and treacherous jungles provided the northern military with tactical cover and vantage points. So how do you fight back against a hidden opponent? You take away their hiding spots. And that's exactly what the US tried to do when they developed the Rainbow Agents, toxic herbicides developed specifically for converting a lush jungle biome into a complete wasteland. Luckily, a bunch of US chemical companies already produced herbicides for use in agriculture to kill off invasive plants that threaten crop yields. The most notable companies were the Dow Chemical Company and the Monsanto Company. These companies were then tasked with upping production for the war effort. In all, six herbicides were developed. Agents Green, Pink, purple, blue, white, and orange, all named after the color-coded barrels that they were shipped in. Agent Orange was released into the environment by any means necessary. Helicopters, planes, boats, trucks, backpacks, whatever could be used to spray liquid everywhere. It's estimated that over 11 million gallons of Agent Orange showered over South Vietnam as well as the neutral countries of Laos and Cambodia. The US government actually sprayed about 20 times more than what the chemical manufacturers deemed necessary to get the job done. You what? Tens of thousands of square miles of rainforest and jungle were devastated in the 60s and 70s. Full ecosystems were flat out destroyed. Surviving wildlife were forced to relocate and, while not directly intended, hundreds of thousands of people were caught in the crossfire, soldiers and civilians alike. Immediate exposure symptoms included skin irritation and swelling as well as difficulty breathing. Overall, the short-term effects were pretty mild and non-threatening. However, it was the long-term effects that packed the punch. In all, 14 diseases are linked with Agent Orange exposure, including various cancers, Parkinson's disease, and severe birth defects thanks to the chemical mixture's genetically damaging mechanism of action. Despite not being solely intended as a chemical weapon against humans, it is estimated that over 300,000 US troops and over 400,000 Vietnamese, Laotian, and Cambodian people have died as a result of Agent Agent Orange's long-term side effects, making the compound one of the deadliest in history. Oh man, what a bummer. You should watch something happier. Here, try this. I'll see you over there. 